what we want to do is just quickly talk through uh, with Jonathan and Alan some of the stuff that they've been doing with MOOCs. So, uh, Jonathan, just to give us a bit of context with what you've been doing, when did it start, um, how's it going now? Okay, so um, you know, I think it's important to set out at the outset that I don't do a MOOC and uh, never have, and so uh, <laughs> that's 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 going great. Um, <laughs> but my background is um, my background is as a photographer, and it's sort of important to just contextualise everything that I've done. My background isn't as an academic or a teacher, you know, it is as a is as a photographer, and I was a fairly successful one in as much as I was shoot I was made made my living solely by making images and by selling photographs um, to uh, newspapers and magazines and so on. Um, but you know, over the course of the 15 years that I, that I did that, my, the business model changed and uh, gradually became uh, fairly broken. And there was a point at which I realized that in fact I, um, photography was going through a, a kind of a paradigm shift. Um, and my business model had relied on photographs and paper and a scarce product being sold at a, at a high price. But now I make, made images, and images, images are abundant. They can be re reproduced um, at, at no cost and, uh, you know, and, and shipped at no cost. And so my business model, it had to change. I mean, I've, I've come to recognize this in retrospect now. Um, but th that, that was a really important moment, understanding that, in fact, the photograph does one thing. It's fixed in time, and it's, it's location-specific. Whereas the image, the image is abundant and it's distributed, uh, and um, and it can connect you to other people. And so, uh, in 2008, um, a friend of mine asked me to to write some classes for a, um, a new course, a new university photography course. And I said, I would I would do it, but I couldn't write the same classes that I'd learnt as a student because you know they'd been written in the 70s or whatever, and. And it would be entirely disingenuous, you know, to to hold up these famous people that I had photographed uh, that represented a business model that had changed completely, and then to try and sell that. So I said, yeah, I'll write the classes, but it has to address these issues. It has to address the fact that, um, you know, it, it's unclear as to what a 21st century photographer is when everyone has a camera and the means to publish. You know, what is it that makes a professional different? Um, and so that was the basis for writing the classes. Now I had to learn how to teach pretty quickly and I had to learn what to teach pretty quickly and so it made sense to stick the class on a blog to ask the big difficult questions publicly and then seek out answers from you know from whoever had them I mean for instance this this idea about rethinking your product you know that's what I had to do as a photographer what was my product when it when it couldn't be photographs anymore when I made images now that was something that uh, the science fiction writer Cory Doctorow um, helped help me to come to an understanding of with when he sort of shared his business model, his um, yeah, one of his business models, he was he was um, giving away ebooks, e versions of his book uh, for free, and still selling hard copy books as well. And he was making a healthy living at this, you know. And he shared that idea of versioning out what we do, rethinking what we do um, with me. And I trialed it as a photographer, and and it was quite successful. So we unpicked things like that in the classes. That's that was the beginnings of a class called Picturing the Body known as PicBod now by its Twitter hashtag and um, and it was something we went on to develop and explore even further in, a, in another class called uh, Photography and Narrative which is known now by its hashtag which is Phonar. Just to summarize that you, you, you took your experiences as a photographer where um, the, the business model was about allowing more, more openness to, to what you were doing as a photographer gave you greater reach and greater impact and to, to mirror that yes. in an education Absol setting. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that was it. So, I, you know, what I what I did was I realized that the images would connect me to people um, using you know, the internet enabled me to use the image to connect to people who I could reach. Um, it was a very discerning way of reaching people who would be most interested in other versions of my product. And so I could I could use the image to reach out to distributed um, geeks, let's say, um, who would then come to me to buy this um, other version of the product, let's say the print, for instance. So a super fan of um, Heath Ledger, I could I would come to me to buy another version of the product. They buy the signed print. Um, so yes, that that was something that that enabled me to do. Now, when coming to teaching, you know, 
the first when I put it on the blog, the first thing that people said was, "If you give this away for free, then no one's going to buy it." And I had to sort of then say, you know, but this is similar to my photography, my journey as a photographer. You know, um, in fact, the product isn't the product isn't the knowledge. You can give that away for free. The product mm -hmm. is the learning experience. And what the pro what what giving away the knowledge does, if you will, is it connects all those people, and you have this, suddenly this sort of very networked experience with a huge amount of added value and added opportunities for the people who bought the version which is to sit in the room, the premium version. And so just when thinking about what you, you, you know, you've got a, a vision of what you want to achieve, uh, in terms of the, the teaching design, you know, what was your, your starting point? Did, was the um, university VLE ever in the picture or was it you wanted to start clean piece of paper from scratch and how did you get from that to, to where you are now? Um, uh, well, I realized very quickly that, um, that any barrier to entry would stop most people um, engaging. And there are a number of barriers to entry. One was so with regard to the university VLE, one was that you had to pay £27,000 to get access to that. Mm. So that narrowed down the class quite quickly and substantially to, you know, whatever it is, 40, 17-year-olds or 40, 18-year-olds in the room. So, um, you know, I, so that really wasn't, wasn't uh, appropriate. And similarly, you know, every time we cons I considered a, a, a space or a different way of teaching or speaking, I had to think, is this going to be a barrier to entry? So it's not using academic language a lot of the time so that anyone can engage with it, not using discipline-specific language so that people could engage with it, using a blog that people didn't have to sign up to to engage with. That was important, so that people would sort of drop by and, and drop in. And of course, there were other th reasons as well for using. I was using Blogger at the time. That's the first first one I did. It, it, so I had no money, mm -hmm. had no money at all, no resources, and so everything had to be free. But what this meant, th and I've realised this afterwards, one of the strengths was that I had no money. I couldn't afford to build an entirely new network. I had to go to the networks that were already established, and those networks happened to be really well populated. And so it meant, you know, going to Twitter, going to Flickr, going to Vimeo, going to SoundCloud, all those spaces where, pe where the fish are already swimming, as it were, mm -hmm. and, and go in there and say who's interested in this class, who's interested in this subject area, rather than having them to change their existing social media behavior, behaviors um, in order to do something entirely different. I mean, that's... I've come to understand now that's largely unsustainable. You know, don't build a new version of Facebook for yeah. the university. Use Facebook. It's really good at being Facebook. So with these spaces, as a photographer, were you already you know, present on Flickr, present on Vimeo? Were, were any of these new spaces for you? It was all new spaces. I hadn't even, I'd never had a blog. Um, I had to learn from scratch. And so if I, you know, I go back now and I... And I was quite open about it. I didn't know how to teach, so I needed to learn as quickly as possible. I asked for help. I didn't know mm. what, how, to, I didn't know what to teach. I didn't, you know, there were no answers. The book's not been written yet on what it is to be a 21st century visual storyteller. So, you, if you go back to that first, it is, it is one blog post for the entire course. The entire course just gets, the entire post is longer and longer and longer, with the comments just getting longer and it's, in, it's acutely embarrassing. But then that's just the nature of learning openly. It is, um, it, people have been nothing but forgiving mm. uh, to me. Every time I've asked for help, people have come out and helped. No one's ever said, well, you, 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 that's, that's rubbish what you did there. People have always been very generous and always sort of sought to help. You know, you're sitting next to Alan Levine, who um, continues to help me constantly, and I hope feed, I feed back to him. The point was, no, I'd never blogged, I'd never used any yeah, spaces yeah. before, so I came as a learner, I came as a, as a peer learner, and I learned, I learned from my students who were using these spaces, and they could tell me how to navigate them. I mean, that wasn't actually a bad thing in itself. Yeah, it's probably at this point we're pulling in Alan, so around 2008, 2009, was that when DS106 started? Uh, actually, it, it was 2010. 2010, uh, right. So, uh, it, in, yeah, that was Jim Groom's creation at University of Mary Washington. I, I had an interest in the, this idea of digital storytelling. I went to a conference first on it in the 90s when it was really a, a film-based thing mm. popularized very well by the Center for Digital Storytelling. A lot about personal narrative and people learning how to craft a story and then present it in digital form. And so 
I was always interested because I've long had an interest in the platform of the web as a uh, means of expression and publishing. And the idea that a story on the web was innately different from a story in sound or in video because of the affordances of the web to link to cross media. You know, and there's people like, you know, Henry Jenkins who've been, you know, researching the idea of transmedia storytelling. And uh, Jim uh, Groom took this course at the University of Mary Washington. It, it is on the books as a computer science class as digital storytelling. It had been taught in a classroom by a teacher with lectures and a book and, and students doing video. And when Jim took it on in January of 2010, he had this idea of putting the students in the web to do their work, but also with the idea of importance of this notion about students learning to be able to create their own digital space. So they would have to register web domains, not use anything the university provided, and learn not only the things about publishing their work, but also what it took to, to install WordPress, to manage things, to have control over that digital space. And I was interested, uh, among other people, you know, I followed what they were doing because the students were publishing their work in the open. Jim was publishing his, you know, class in the open, and you could be part of it as an observer, and that was very interesting. And then in October of 2010, someone asked him, you know, and this was in the context of the first, you know, MOOC, uh, the CCK08 that George Siemens and Stevens Down did, the idea about having a network that participated in the course. So, uh, you know, we were aware and influenced by that, but the idea of DS-106 in January 2010 being something that people not registered in the course could participate in, um, they would set up their own blogs and have their content feed into the central course. And the, the, the parallels, I think, that are very important and why I got very interested in what Jonathan was doing, um, different sort of approaches to platforms, but similar in the idea that the students who paid for the class and had the classroom experience, you weren't trying to replicate that same experience for the open participants. And at the same time, what the open participants did was not the same as, as the students were doing, but there was somewhat of an overlap. So you benefit by having people from the outside participate, react, communicate, maybe even collaborate with these students. But they definitely had a different experience. And, mm -hmm. and to me, that's what makes what we're doing not really the MOOC-like thing where you're trying to have everybody go through and get the same carbon copy experience. Something is quite interesting that's kind of a thread between these is the, the literacies that people are developing as they go along. So Jonathan, you were saying, you know, you were picking this, you were learning as you were going along. And I, I'd imagine a lot of your students are, are learning as they're going along. It's a course after all, they should be learning, but they're learning about the kind of digital presence, um, being online, publishing stuff online. Is, is, is that all kind of integrated into the course in terms of support? In, um, in terms of support, um, it's actually it's, it's it's kind of fundamental and it's grown to be fundamental. We, we talk we've talked about digital photography for years, but we haven't actually thought about what that means. We've always talked about what it does. You know, it means a digital camera, but to be to actually discuss what the image means, what we've we've never really done that. Um, and so yes, now the course is much more now about visual literacy and about digital fluency. And so yes, it's about um, having something to say being able to say it very clearly, but then in this digital, in amongst all the digital noise, it's about being heard. And that's the bit about the sort of digital fluency. So is it supported in a, in a sort of academic sense? Ye yes, you know, um, it's now, in, it's now you know, part of the fabric of the course. You know, we have to learn how to use these spaces and how to use and navigate through these spaces, these um, digital spaces. We also sort of think about what it is to be a sort of digital citizen as well. Um, you know, uh, we, we, I often you sort of, when we talk about how to use, um, say, let's say an, an environment, a blog or some or something, or or, or Flickr or the, the the digital version of the classroom, I sort of say, you know, I I um, 
describe it in terms of what would it be like if you were going into a cafe or a bar that you regularly go into as a student, you know, and, um, you know, think about how you, you act in that space. So, for instance, if you're wondering why you're not getting, uh, why the network hasn't responded to your request or why no one's commenting on your blog, then imagine if you were going into this cafe, it's your local cafe, and you go in there, you go in there every day of the week. On a Monday, you're, you, know, you, you speak to everyone, you, you're, you, you have, have a great time, you're smiling, shaking hands, and so on and so forth, making lots of friends. On Tuesday, perhaps you do the same, but on Wednesday, you walk in and completely ignore everyone. And then you don't speak to anyone again on Thursday. Um, and then, then come Friday, you, know, you need a favor. So you walk in there and you start asking people for favors. I mean, what sort of a person, who does that? I mean, how did, would you respond to someone that does that in a, in a normal uh, analog, if you will, sort of social environment? You know, you, you probably would question them, wouldn't you? You'd question their motives. And so it's much the same in, in, a, in a virtual space. You know, you go into this virtual classroom. You know, you have to be civil, <laughs> and um, you know, if you if you want blog comments, then go and comment on other people's blogs. Engage in a dialogue rather than thinking of rather than actually using this like a broadcast tool. And so, you know, I mean, we start. I start by describing Flickr as being a great listening device, a great way to tune the networks. Mm. You know, I talk about Facebook as being somewhere that where all your friends are that you went to school with. Now think about Twitter as as the play, as as all the people you wish you'd gone to school with and then tune into their conversations and then you can listen to them in real time you can actually dip into those conversations in real time if you want to and you can actually you know engage in a dialogue and so yeah we you know it's it's really important to to learn how to navigate those spaces together i suppose you get this question quite often that how much of a administration overhead is it to run your the course in the way you have Administration overhead. Uh, okay, so yeah, that might, we should clarify exactly. Me opening up by saying I don't run a MOOC. So you know, mine is a regular class um, yeah. which sits within a closed undergraduate course, photography course. It lasts for ten weeks. Um, but as Alan described, you know, there is a version of the of the experience that you can have by joining joining via the blog, um, submitting your pictures, listening to the lectures. Crucially, one of the crucial things is tweeting your notes. So if people are listening now, and I'm not making sense, if you tweet your questions, if you inc and we haven't established a hashtag, so I'm, I guess you're going to, you, maybe you can establish a hashtag afterwards. Because I'm listening in. I'm listening in now, just as the, um, as the lecture, as the contributors are to phone are, after we've recorded a lecture, they listen in very often, and they'll actually respond to the notes and the comments that people put as they listen to the lectures. And so I'll, I'll do that now. I'll try and answer questions now if people have, have them. But um, I have... Gone and lost my thread. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I, I, no, yeah. if I could jump in, I, mm. I mean, I mean, Jonathan downplays, uh, you know, his his not being an academic, but his intuition is, is so perfect for this about how people engage and the idea, um, the unmook idea that it's not this box that's a course that is an entire experience that there's this whole cultural and and social framework that that builds around it that that means human to human. Uh, a connection and and the way we we interact with each other, which you can't package, you can't plan, you can you can set up. So it, it like in DS one hundred and six, we don't prescribe so much. The digital classes and learning ends up like Jonathan describes, focusing on the tools, and it, it becomes it becomes so minute and uninteresting. And the end product, and students come in with, I always I refer to it as like an assignment mindset. They need to produce something that's polished. And that's what they, they chuck in the box. And what we really want to encourage is the people to sort of uh, share their process and share the thinking behind the media things that they create and create stuff that's bad. So we have sort of the same philosophy about we don't come off uh, as teachers of this class as being perfect. So we mess up in public and students see that and they realize I don't have to be perfect and I can try something new that doesn't have to be perfect, and it's okay. And then they get the support of the the community around them. So that that community building thing, and and even this idea, you know, this word we always talk about building communities. You don't really build communities; they they happen, and they don't happen accidentally. They happen in some you know nexus of place, whether it's a cafe or a park. But they don't always happen where you build your nice shiny course MOOC box. 
No, and, and those communities as well have become um, the, probably the most valuable aspect of our entire course. There are, there are, currently, there are still only two open classes within the degree program. But, you know, the, the most people we've had come to one 10-week iteration is over 35,000. Now, that's 35, that, the, the compound network opportunities from, the, from that many people coming to, coming to look at your work and listen to the class with you over 10 weeks is phenomenal. And as you say, Alan, you, you can't. You can, yeah. You can build those. You can, you can put the things in place to ho and hope those uh, networks sort of build. But um, I think, I think the most one of the most valuable things that people can now draw from some of the stuff that we've done is to adapt and adopt, adapt or adopt the st some of the things that we've done because they can make less mistakes. But don't want people to go away thinking that there, that what we do, even though I've sort of described it as learning, learning how to teach and learning what to teach that it lacks rigor or any sort of sustained academic engagement because it doesn't you know I think it is fairly uh, rigorous and there is um, we, are, we, work, I, we work really really hard to make sure that the quality is, is the very best that we can we can make it I mean I think this should be this is we should rethink what the product is as an education as an education institution as educators you know I can't see a reason for not teaching this way it's so valuable it enriches the mm -hmm. learning experience so much it repositions what we do um, and it actually you know it, it doesn't actually cost that much at all it just kind of makes sense I mean we're talking about open and connected teaching and learning here let's not use I'm not going to use the word MOOC because mine isn't a mine isn't Mine isn't distance learning on an industrial scale, which is, I think, which is what I see when I see most MOOCs. You know, I think that actually works out to de laus I think, if we're going to start. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that, that kind of, um, um, but um, <clears throat> what, what, what I'm saying is that to, to actually think that the class isn't already connected is a kind of a mistake, because mm -hmm. the class is connected. The students are all on Facebook. They're all on Twitter. They're all on all those. So the class is connected. The only person at this point who isn't connected is the teacher. And so... Where's the sense in that? If the, if the teacher just connects to this network, then they can augment and enrich the experience, not only of learning, but actually of teaching as well. You, I've, learned, I've learned how to teach, and I'm learning how to teach from people that are really into this, and they're really good teachers. You know, it's, it's, it's accelerated the, how I've learned to do what I do. Um, I don't know, a hundredfold, it must be. And so <clears throat> it seems to me that there, there kind of isn't an option. There isn't an option for photographers anymore. The old business model is broken. The product is very, very different now. If you want to operate as a visual storyteller in the 21st century, then you have to rethink what your skill sets are and what your values are as a supplier. And so I think it's much the same for educators, um, that we have, to, we, we, we have to rethink what we are, and we're in a great position to do this. Mm -hmm. The bricks and mortar experience is very expensive to run, but it's marvelous. It's great. It's what students go to want to go to college for. There is no reason why we can't have this virtual version as well, enriching that uh, on-site experience. Um, it really is a win-win, virtuous circle, mm. whatever you want to describe it as. I mean, Jonathan's parallel example of his recognition of, of how his business model for photography is, is not adaptable to the way science, you know, t technology and culture are going. You know, MOOCs get expensive largely because of this reliance on, on high production video. I mean, that's where those big costs are. That's why they're getting into these hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is there's a lot being put into these high production videos. And that's not really changing much of the methodology of the teaching. That's, that's one of those you know, transference of what is done inside the classroom to going on, on the web. And if, you, uh, and if people are sparking up their, um, their Twitter tweet decks or whatever they use, if you do a search on the hashtag Phonar, then the reason I'm not with you today is because I had to teach my Phonar class this morning, and Alan Carney flew over from America just to attend our Phonar class in person. That is the only reason I am in the UK, Jonathan, you know that. Right. What's he doing here then? <laughs> and so I'm, so, if you, it, I'm soaking up the sunshine. <laughs> And if you so my, if you have if you do do a search on Phonar right now, then you should see the echoes of today's class. So um, today we will have listened to a lecture, to an interview that I did this morning um, with an artist called Sarah Davidman, and with um, the path with the founder of the Path Charlotte Institute in Bangladesh, which I did last week. Uh, he's gone back to Bangladesh, and so you should see echoes of the the, the tweets, the comments, and the discussion there if you sort of scroll through that. I hope so, anyway. <laughs> But um, if you uh, tweet now or have been tweeting, then hopefully I'm responding to and Alan is responding to your comments and questions.